guys, we are here today and we have some gems for you guys. We're going to talk about the red flags of trauma and what you need to know, as well as green flags. So we are going to start it off with just talking about just some, some behavioral signs of distress that are really important to be mindful of as you're on your journey to wellness. So yeah, it's it's pretty cool because in our you know, our therapy practice, folks come in and in the beginning, we're teasing things out. And so our ears kind of perk up when we hear certain um, behavioral um, activities or thought processes. I said, no, that might be more than just you stressed and you're upset. It sounds like it might be um, a response to something traumatic that a person has experienced and it gives us an opportunity to get more education. So I think it's important for us to talk about how can you recognize these signs within yourself? And um, there might be times you need help teasing it out. Like, am I, am I actually okay? Or have I been dealing with this for the past three months, six months, nine months, a year, five years, 10 years. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. It feels like normal. It feels like every day, but um if you talk to a therapist, you might say, do you want some relief around that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you want some support around? Yes. And I love you highlight. I love that you highlighted the time frame, right? Um, because what I notice is my ears really perk up when I notice themes like, oh, this is a pattern across different spans of your life, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is a pattern at work or this is a pattern at home and all of these different areas where very similar behaviors, thoughts, um, manifest and I'm like there might be something something going on here yeah. that we should look at and typically a lot of times it stems back years right this is right. this is years of things that have been um been sitting with you for a while right because right. you'll we'll ask well how long well when was the last time you noticed that and mm -hmm. when it's worse right so we can kind of differentiate is that a recent thing that's just, you know, kind of hard to work through, or is this kind of my normal baseline of my interactions with people or my interactions when I'm out socially or when I'm at work, um, but we're looking at the disturbance. So with um, how it shows up is some of these very common, common ways that are, are pretty normal in our society, right? Mm -hmm tiredness like if you ask, well how, how are you doing tired mm -hmm. okay well what went on this weekend right so we had a conversation even before the camera started about feeling tired but it was tied to like not being able to rest over the weekend mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how that can look different from exhaustion like certain people every day every time you talk to them they're exhausted right right in all that is, situations in every situation all day or most of the time right like five out of seven days I feel tired I get two good days of where I feel energized right um and another one that I notice is like people's thought patterns too um and I'll, I'll ask them like how long have you been experiencing this or feeling this way or believe in this 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 um belief and sometimes they're like I don't know I've, I've felt this way my whole life right like, so they start to internalize um, thoughts about themselves based on experiences they've had um, throughout their lives. So mm -hmm. that's another one where it's like, okay, I'm mm -hmm. not good enough, right? That's mm -hmm. a big one. Um, how long have you been feeling that way? I don't know, my whole life. Yeah, I, and, it, and that's the part where when we're asking the questions and it's like, hold on, let me think about it, right? So therapy offers the opportunity to like think things through mm -hmm. um, and some of that kind of, um, you know, thought distortions or things that we see in people's thought process can look like confusion. Well, I don't know. Right. So sometimes trauma can disrupt how you store your information. Yep. And so confusion um, can be something that like is really hard for me to study when we think about students who who might be in school or if you're um, trying to work through something at work and mm -hmm. it's just kind of hard to put two and two together like yeah yeah um, 
that can be a, a traumatic response of the brain being really overloaded with information and sensory, you know, things that you're seeing that is just kind of scrambled. So feeling confused is definitely mm -hmm. one that uh, comes out a lot or just like when you have to pause to think, like mm -hmm. you gotta go through the Rolodex of yes. memories to get, get the answer. It takes, it may take a while. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And even memory loss too, right? Like sometimes you can't even go through that Rolodex and it's like, I can't even remember um, parts of my life. Right. Right. Um, like because you have been disassociated or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, forgetfulness is another one. So I hear you with the confusion and I'm like, that's a big one. And it made me think of these other ones that um, are are really big um, in my practice and what I notice. Mm -hmm. um, the one that clients laugh at when uh, when we're looking at is like irritability. Oh, mm hmm. How often have you felt irritable or agitated? Um, and they're like, all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay. And and it's it could be funny, but that experience of being irritated um, or irritable rather can be really disturbing. That's mm -hmm. like, that sounds are too loud. Mm -hmm. like talking too much. Or mm -hmm. I can't stand, you know, the way someone's eating their food, that those sensitivities to mm -hmm. sounds around them or people. Mm -hmm. I can't be around so, so and so, or I can't be right where your nervous system is over again, overloaded by what you're experiencing. Right, exactly. And when you when you say irritability, it makes me think of like the angry black woman, especially like in our community, right, where they start to label this as something that is really not like it might just be a trauma response right. um and um something that can that you can find relief with right. right right so i hear you with the irritability it shows up and it shows out uh -huh. and, and it's signs for you too to recognize i'm feeling irritable we mm -hmm. like so and so is irritating or that thing is irritating me or that right we can externalize it um, but I want folks to begin to start seeing when you notice that you're feeling irritable, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what might be going on where you, you know, sometimes it's tied to like growing up in a chaotic family or community where there was a lot going on. And now that you're an adult, you can kind of, um, limit those interactions, but it mm -hmm. doesn't mean we have the words like, you know, I, I don't like to be around chaos. I don't like to be around drama. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Exactly. And how empowering is it to recognize like what's coming up for you versus externalizing it um, to all of the things around you? Right. The, the things around us, we don't have any control over mm -hmm. uh, or we don't have much control over. Right. But we do have all of the control on how we process it and, you know, reflect within ourselves. And I don't want to say we don't have any any control because because we can set right. boundaries and there's things that we can do. Right. Um, but it's typically what I notice in my practice is, is when people are externalizing, it's coming from a powerless place. Like right. I can't do anything about this. Yeah, I'm feeling out of control or the situation feels so big. The best thing is for me to try to get out, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's also the opposite. It can look the opposite. Like a very yep. subdued person who has no like facial expression, um, things can be happening around them and it's almost like they're glazed over, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. both people are having like an overwhelmed, internal like overwhelmed experience, mm -hmm. but it may look very yep. different. Yep. That yep. person may be monotone, they may be one wordy, very blunted. Mm -hmm. uh, just not giving you much, right? And it's like, mm -hmm. that person, I don't, they stand offish. <laughs> yep, exactly. And there's so much going on internally, right? Like there's all of these things going on internally, probably, um, but on the external, you don't see any of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or people don't see any of that. Um, yeah. So another one that I feel like um, uh, that is a sign of distress that people may not recognize is like difficulty sleeping or even having nightmares. 
yeah. um, frequent nightmares, right? Um, feeling under attack or reliving experiences in, in your sleep. Right. So yeah. that. I'm seeing a lot of, you know, a lot of sleep disturbances, mm -hmm. insomnia. I just can't fall asleep. My mind won't allow me to unwind. And um, I'm just, you know, trying to watch TV until I fall asleep or look at my phone until I fall asleep and um, just having a hard time actually unwinding. So you have a system that wants to stay on. You know, your mm -hmm. body is ready mm -hmm. for anything. Mm -hmm. It's time to go to sleep. Exactly. Those same people may be moody the next day. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> they can't go to sleep. And when they fall asleep, it might be a hard time staying asleep. Like some people might, it's easy to fall asleep. Right. Staying asleep might be the challenge. Or even people who sleep a lot, like that hypersomnia, right? Where they're sleeping all day, very fatigued, no energy, struggle to get out of bed. Um, like system has just completely shut down. Right, mm -hmm. like the overactive system, and then on the other side of the spectrum, it is the underactive system where it is it, just flat. Yeah, yeah. and that mm -hmm. could look like the folks who <clears throat> needing coffee, you know, needing stimulants to get through the day. Yep. Um, needing sugar, like eating a lot of candies, um, sweets, those kind of things. We don't always know the the connection to that. That like your body is craving. For you to get some energy and we know the quickest we don't always think all oh, the quickest way is some sugar but your body knows that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so for folks who always got candy next to them or the one who's always drinking coffee right the big venti yeah any time of the day, of the day. <laughs> yes. yes yeah that there, is definitely that there might be something more to that and 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 back to like sleep when um, you're not getting enough sleep, folks in their bodies, they may notice like higher blood pressure. Mm. And we know like in, in the Black community or a lot of communities of color, like blood pressure is. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have an auntie who's always like, when she's stressed out, oh, my pressure is getting up. My pressure, is, that's her thing. My pressure is up. There is a correlation to your stress response and your blood pressure. Yep. Yep. For sure. 100%. 100%. You can totally um, see people with heart issues, you know, later down the road with this persistent issue around sleep and just kind of managing our, our reactions to things that we're, that we're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, cause I know you have the medical background and you're saying insomnia, there's a direct correlation to, um, blood pressure, heightened blood pressure. What about the hypersomnia? Like when people are sleeping too much, do you feel like it's the same result or is it specific to insomnia? That might be more connected to like our exercise level, right? We're not giving our body enough movement and that kind of sedentary lifestyle, Mm -hmm. and increase our blood pressure among other things. So I, I don't have the science around that, but extremes in any direction does have an impact on our health. So when we mm -hmm. look at people, you know, one of the biggest things that I think that stings out to me is Kaiser did research on adverse childhood experiences. So the ACE mm -hmm. studies, yeah. they looked at folks who had a lot of adverse childhood experiences had greater health issues as they got older. And so we look at if there was a, um, a, a traumatic event that happened, that can directly impact your health. So people do see issues with like sleep, their mm -hmm. blood pressure, um, stomach issues. Mm -hmm. That's um, a good one. Even folks like sweating, like excessive sweating, you know, that can be something. And then like elevated um, heartbeat that can mm -hmm. just always kind of feeling panicked. Yeah. Like that racing heart rate for sure. For sure. And when you talk about the AC, ACE, um, I think a lot of times we don't even recognize that some of our childhood experiences could have been distressing or traumatic, right? Like even like constant yelling in the home. 
um, having a family member that's incarcerated or struggling with their own mental illness. Mm -hmm. uh, like we think about the physical abuse and sometimes that's even normalized, right? Mm -hmm. well, some of these things that um, can be common in family systems can also be distressing. And what I'm hearing you say, there are studies to prove that there are long-term consequences if it's not treated. So that's why we call it trauma. You know, people don't like that word. It's like, well, you know, I, it, you know, I raised my kids this way, my parents, right. And uh, we're not trying to like point the finger at anyone. We're just looking at the effect on the person. How was that experience? You know, some people get, right. get, get yelled at or have a stern talking to and it hurts their feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some people who can, who have had experience like, extreme corporal punishment, um, beat, you know, and mm -hmm. they don't have those reactions. So when we look at not just what happened, but how the person is responding to it, right? Yeah. So these reactions and these responses are really important to recognize because sometimes we are acting out on what we know, but if you see a kid flinches, oh, maybe, maybe that was... Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We always have the ability to correct and uh, repair. That when, right there, yep. Yeah. When we, mm -hmm. when we mess up, when yep. we make a mistake. Yep. Cause we're, I mean, we're human and I, you know, I know there are times in my home where I'm like, okay, I definitely could have handled that differently. Right. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm big on like, I'm sorry. Like mommy was wrong. Like I should not have done that. This, this doesn't mean anything about you. You know, and, and children are different. Some children can handle a little bit more. Um, and then some some children, their threshold is different. Right. So it, it is important to recognize, like you said, like a child who is flinching, like that might not be received well. They not, yeah. that's yeah. not that one. And For we'll sure. talk about that threshold a little bit later. I'm looking forward to when we get there. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a perfect um, time to segue on. We talked about a lot of like the behavioral signs of distress, um, but we really want to break them down into different categories. And again, like it, this is not black and white. There are some gray, but just giving you guys some key indicators on like what to look out for when you are behaviorally distressed. Right. So there are four of them. So we got fight, flight, fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. Mm 